done wrong. You do what you got to do. Do what you got to do. Help desk yeah. stories part four. It's not done right. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna whip through these uh, help desk stories pretty quick uh, on these, so because we've only got a very short period of time, and we've got a 50 or 60 cars to talk about here. Uh, we'll get used to that. And, um, this guy has a 1996 Saturn SL2 four cylinder. When not start consistently, stop to get gas. Wouldn't start back up. No repairs attempted. In other words, this guy didn't. They did nothing to do any to to fix it. And three hours later, it started up, but it wouldn't stay running. Uh, not the first time it wouldn't start. But you guys talking that over. But it's the first time it would not stay running after it started. So now it won't start again. So he's like, and it starts now. Start now. Start it again. Or when it won't start, the motor turns over for a second or two. Then it sounds like a starter disengages from the live flywheel. Now that's a, what kind of problem is that? Oh, he stopped to get gas, and it wouldn't start back up after he put gas in. Didn't do anything. Started three hours later, but it wouldn't stay running. All right. So now the second part sounds like they have broken the flywheel. Not a broke tooth. He's basically probably got a bad overrunning clutch in his starter. <coughs> it has to spin very long. The overrunning clutch releases and you'll be here. You know. I got a video on that. That's the engine I heard. That's what, when you hear one go, whoa, 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 yeah, that typically means the overrunning clutch in the starter drive is bad. Uh, this one might be tough. Anybody got any ideas? That's, that is, that's, uh, at first blush, that sort of sounds good, but um, no cigar. Where is it? Uh, I know it's like a uh, can sense is bad sometimes it'll crank up and it'll die. You said the battery is only running for three to twelve and a half volts. Yeah, that's nothing wrong with that. Whenever it's been sitting there spinning, you know, I wouldn't be bothered by that. But it was spinning. You see what I'm saying? A lot of a lot of people, bless their heart, all they know how to do is get the alternator checked to put a battery in it. I mean, you know, whatever else is wrong, they have a clue. Adam was talking about that one time. You know. All right. Coolant temperature sensor likes to fail on those cars and cause a problem, but that's just an educated guess. Might be a good educated guess, he said, because I noticed the temperature gauge was doing weird things for the past week. Not registering. Would this have an effect on the transmission? The transmission won't shift into overdrive on the highway. Well, if it thinks the engine is cold, the torque converter won't lock up. Now, why does, what the heck this difference would it make if, why does the torque converter not lock up when it's reading a cold engine? <coughs> Huh? What? It puts more load on the motor. It's locked up. I guess they don't know. It won't lock up, though. What it won't saying, lock up if the engine's I'm cold. Saying maybe that's like a default when it's cold, but they don't want much load on it. Well, actually, they want the transmission to heat up quicker when it's cold and when the engine's cold. So they let the torque converter keep shearing that fluid until the transmission comes up to operate temperature and the engine both. And then the torque converter gets where it'll lock in. I think the breakover is like 170 degrees or something like that. Um, so far. I want to thank you for your help. It was exactly what you said. Temperature sending unit, 10 bucks, and it fixed everything. Torque converter now kicks in also. And we broke, we sunk a basket on that one. Right, that's pretty good. Thanks for your help, guys. I really appreciate that. I wouldn't ever be able to do it. Okay. Uh, our car has been coughing and shaking when going slow and dies on us sometimes. If not, pressing on the gas, this is the Ford Focus, and recently started doing this one going regular speed. I changed the gas and air filter, it seemed to stop after the air filter, but then got worse again. I don't know the engine size, but the H digit is number three. Do you have any suggestions on what I can try next or what the problem is? This must be a female because she'll have the engine size. Well, I wouldn't go so far as to say that. Sometimes people come in here to have their vehicle rode up, they don't know if it's a four-cylinder or a V6, let alone what the engine size is. And a lot of them aren't even sure what your model is for either. Are you serious? So, yep. All right. So, uh, answer this. What do you think? Uh, it's not Sputtering, good. skipping, cutting out. No, it's running. Running terrible. Yep. Put air filter on it, seemed to help it, and then it went back to doing it. Massive. Yeah, that's possible. Got a bad <coughs> well, you guys are thinking. That's good. Next thing I'd do would be replacing spark plugs. Further, the ignition coils Ford used on that year are kind of weak and prone to fail. 
Oh, this is exactly what was wrong with it. It's amazing hanging down there without even having to see the car. Thanks a million. God bless. And I tell you, he never did say what they did. But I told them spark plugs and coil. They probably went and bought spark plugs and coil. Because a lot of times when I send somebody an email back, any part that I mention, they rush out and buy it. Even if I say, well, if this is reading this way and that's going that way, then you might think about this, that, and the other. And if I mention any part in it amongst all of that stuff, they rush out and buy that part and put it on there no matter what I said. Anyway. They got past that one. My keys don't work the door lock through that arm anymore. I replaced the batteries in them several times. They still won't work. I wanted to know how much it's going to cost me. Of course, I don't do pricing. You know, people always say, how much is this going to cost? You know, uh, well, I have to take the vehicle in for this. Reset the lock switch thing. Like how do you do that? I'm not 100%, but some of you press the brake pedal so many times, turn on the key. And then, uh, he may reprogram the fobs. Yeah. That's what he's doing? That's what I was trying to say. Okay. Yeah, have we talked about one of this before? One like this before in a similar health story? Maybe. I don't know. I mean, I do that with X-Core because the car will all go off. Okay. <laughs> 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 hmm. The central timer module likes to fail on those and will probably have to be replaced. Let's try this first. Disconnect the battery, both cables, touch the cables together for a few seconds, not the battery terminals on the battery, just the cables. Reconnect the battery, tighten the cable, see what it does, that reboots the central terminal module. Look at there, he finally got home and had a chance to do that, and it worked! They were so pleased. When in doubt, if the door locks don't work, touch the battery cables together and reboot everything and then put it back on. You'd be surprised how many times just rebooting those modules to get them to wake up and clean up their act. And I've seen this several times. I mean. First time I ran into it was on a Dodge Caravan, but there were other people that knew about it before I did. But anyway, uh, that works. Sidecar has no headlights, no taillights, or blinker. 94 Dodge Dakota. This almost looks like a Jonathan Price truck, but the paint job is too good on it. Okay, when I got the truck, I had a bad blinker on the driver's on the passenger <coughs> side. I replaced the bulb, and then I had no lights anywhere. What could be wrong with it? It had a short in that blinker. A short in the blinker. Uh, define short. Well, it's, that blinker was gone for some reason, correct? And you replaced it. And well, it's now bulbs die all the time. You, know? you ever seen anybody short of these with aluminum foil? Yeah. That's a, you know, they used to, the old screw in glass used in the house, they put a penny behind it. Yep. You, know what I'm yeah. you tell me, this is this a trick question? All right, we'll look at the wiring schematic helps there. See if you've lost power to fuses five, six, seven, and eight. See those? In the three junction block. Those fuses, they're the same bus bar. They're fed from fuse G in the power distribution center. Because I didn't put that up here, but it's where I found it. Check for power across fuse G. If fuse G stays powered, the wire will need to be repaired between the PDC and the GAB. Okay, so he, everything that was fed by these four fuses, and see, this is what I'm always telling you guys when you do electrical stuff, always look for stuff that it has in common. And if there's four fuses is powering up a bunch of stuff that's not working, find out what feeds those four fuses on the same bus bar. If that fuse is popped, then all of those fuses are going to be dark. And you look for common connectors, common grounds, common power, all that stuff. It's really important. Now this is an old, older Chrysler wiring schematic. You might notice the peculiarities of it. That's a splice. This is basically going to another place. You got a little connector. We have connector pin Isn't that beautiful? This is basically telling you what that connector looks like and what each one of those circuits go to. That was a really well-drawn wiring schematic, I thought. However, on these kind of wiring schematics here, you would flip back and forth from page to page tracing a circuit. Because it goes all over the place. And, uh, but these, these Chrysler schematics weren't that terribly bad. <laughs> Which sheets they were on and all that. That is section 8W in your old Chrysler wiring. Not around Thank you so much. I'm getting ready to trade this truck and the lights are working now. I can't thank you enough. I'm not sure what he did unless he replaced Fuse G, you know, so anyway. They don't always tell me what they did, but they, they, they send back a really excited whatever they picked, you know. 94 Ranger. All right. This is, uh, Jonathan, let's see what you can do with this one here. Uh, four wheel drive, three of A few months ago, it was running rough, took it to a shop, and they replaced number two injector. It fixed the problem of running rough. It said it's had a problem starting in the morning, it will start right up. But when he drives it for a while and turns it off, it'll start right up again, no problem. Let it sit for an hour or five <coughs> hours. He has to crank it a couple of times to get it to start. And when it starts, it runs rough for a couple of seconds. 
And sometimes you can smell gas like it's flooding. And get back to the same mechanic. He replaced the fuel pressure regulator, fuel pump relay, eek relay, checked and reset the timing to no avail. He says he has no idea. Sounds like it to me. You have to feel like you probably are pretty well target there. All right. Get it to the point where it'll exhibit the symptoms. Shut it off while it's still running, man. Pull the spark plug, then the city weapon will have a dripping injector. If you remove the injector, that injector will have a solar, will have a clean tip. And then he says, thanks, works great now, Tom. <laughs> Ain't that a great follow-up? I have no clue. I don't have no idea if he did what I see. He probably went and had the guy put all the rest of the injectors on it. You know. All right, here's an 89 Cutlass. This is pretty comical here. I'm a poor woman. When I say poor, I mean if I can't get my car fixed and it dies on me, I'll be walking to the soup line. You know, she's completely broke. You're way off up in uh, Washington <coughs> State somewhere. The problem started two weeks ago. Filled up the tank, drove about 30 miles, turned it off for about 10 minutes, went out and started again. Took three to four tries, smell like gas, but it started. Since then, it's been the same thing over and over. Starts just finding the morning every time. I have to try and troubleshoot the problem before I allow a mechanic to take me to the bank for something simple. Uh, an 89 old mobile Cutlass Supreme Duo. Really appreciate any suggestions you may have. All right. She needs help. What about it? You need a lap plan? What? The clock's running. What's it doing? Were you even listening? <laughs> no, it's going to back up and show him the whole slide again. You're I disqualified. Huh? I was thinking about Washington. Huh? I was thinking about. Was that something good in Washington? Somebody let him in on what was going on. She parked she it parked hard it. to start. I was the last one to find Oh, yeah. Yeah, hard to start. And you know that whenever you give somebody a big long diatribe about something, and you go, la 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 la, and they go, huh? Say what? What did you just say? Possibilities: an internally leaking fuel pressure regulator, a dripping injector. These are educated guesses. If the vacuum line is disconnected from the fuel pressure regulator and there is fuel there, the regulator is bad. When it pushes that fuel through that diaphragm and it goes through that vacuum line, it's going to go into the intake. It's going to fill the engine up. Make sure they change the oil when the repairs are done and let me know how it turned out. If something, if you've got a fuel pressure regulator or an injector that's been dripping or something like that, if it gets enough gas in the oil, I have seen it where I fixed the problem but it still ran terrible because the gas, but there's so much gas in the oil. So always realize that you're probably going to need to do an oil change if you've got one that's getting raw gas that's going into the cylinder. <coughs> in extreme circumstances, I've seen raw gas go into the cylinder so much that my hydraulic lock one and bust a piston. You know, sometimes that happens. Dear Richard, ended up taking my car to the technical college here. They have an automotive course. The instructor has his master's degree. It was exactly what you said. If the vacuum line is disconnected from the fuel pressure regulator or fuel there, the regulator is bad. $237 parts and labor. Ouch. But she got it fixed. Uh, be picking it up sometime. They wanted to know without your reasoning, Paul might have been stranded. You know, $237. Now, some of these you got to pull the intake manifold off like, to replace the regulator. And I don't know if that was one of those or not. I they get paid later. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't get that either. I mean, but now that's on the opposite corner of the country. I don't know how that works. Right, uh, what are we getting paid? 2001 Grand Cherokee. All right, watch this one now. This is important. I was pulling away from work about two weeks ago and it sputtered and died. Will restart and idle, but can't put in gear and drive or rev up. I got codes, random misfire, cam and crank sensors, one and three coils. Replace the sensors and the coil with no luck. I replaced the fuel, check the fuel PSI at the rail, and it's perfect at 45, thinking all that was left with the PCM. I ordered one, installed it today, and it still won't start up and run. I'm out of ideas. <coughs> Any help would be great. What are you telling me? Sorry. Tell him sounds they like you've got a problem. They won't even rev up. It just it runs terrible. He's getting uh, coil primary faults. You know, cutting up. I think I'm going all the coils one at a time so while it's running to see if it cleared mm -hmm. up. You, oh, you see if it, well, you're thinking like the, uh, well, this one here, so he's got a coil rail. 
and then when you unplug one, you unplug them all. You know? So it just, it's like a, a waste park, especially. It's not cop. Don't leave on that one. I wonder if uh, he got the wrong rail when he put it on there. That's possible there. That is extremely possible. And that's another one we talked about earlier. Right. He had done that. He got the wrong fuel rail. I mean, I'm just going to call rail, excuse me, not fuel rail. That's not what was wrong with this one, though. I said, make sure the cam synchronizer has it locked up, because the cam sensor removed is a cup spin when the engine turns. If you look down at that cam sensor on these, on, on those, that vintage, for some strange reason, that shaft that spins in that little cam synchronizer like we've been talking about over here, it will lock up, and you'll see where that thing, it's got a hole down, and if you see where it's turned, <clears throat> sometimes you'll see that on Explorers, too. It locks that thing up. And then on the Explorer, it's got a, a, a little thing, a little shaft down in there that doesn't even have a cam sensor on it, or some of them, and all it does is turn the oil pump. And it'll, it'll seize up, you know, and, and try to turn it in. Anyway, set the cam sensor, line it up on zero, rotate the cam synchronizer until you poke a toothpick through the sink housing into the cup, it rotates inside. And believe it or not, like I was talking about on my scan tools, old coats, and toothpicks, Whenever that cam sensor is out of time, it will throw coil primary faults when there's not a dead gun thing wrong with the coil. Obviously, there's an algorithm that was typed wrong, whatever they built with these. You know. All right. We set the cam sensor, but all that did was make it start better. It was five degrees off. I hooked up the modus again. We have three codes PO353, 351, 352, all our ignition coil primary circuit code. See, that's still thinking, I'm feeling like there's something going on there. At start, it starts up and I was perfect. When you start to give it throttle, it goes from close to open loop and starts to spit and sputter. If it doesn't die, it'll start to idle like it's only running on a few cylinders. I've seen this before, but for a slightly different reason than this guy was talking about. Also, we'll run lean and the injectors are way open at about seven and a half milliseconds pulse width rather than the three and a half or so they are at when it's idling smooth. Is it exhaust stop? Well, you know, that's not really such a bad thing, but the fact is, Jonathan, he keeps getting these ignition coil primary faults. So that is point me in the direction of the cam synchronizer, some issue with that. Right? I mean, because anytime you see that, if the cam synchronizer is out of time, it's going to throw those ignition coil, and it's going to do this. It may idle this time. You may drive the darn thing 30 miles, and then all of a sudden it starts dropping companion cylinders. It starts dropping like one and six or two and five or three and four. And, and it may not always be the same ones that it's dropping and it'll throw primary fault. That's only on one of these. All right. The first thing you check was the synchronizer cup. It moved a bit, but not to the point I thought the gear pin was sheared. It was misspelled sheared. So I moved on to everything else. And this is that pin and down at the bottom of that. With the backfire, I knew it still had to be a timing problem. I decided to pull the synchronizer and so it physically checked the gear of the pin. And what happened was this pin was partially sheared, and that gear had the shaft out of line. So the, the crankshaft is turning the camshaft, and the camshaft is actually turning the gear. But the gear on the bottom wasn't consistently lined up with the shaft that he had adjusted. And so when he went ahead and took care of that, he got a roll pin, drove it through there, and got it all tightened up, took care of it. All right. <laughs> this is a 4 liter Ford Ranger, 98 month. I have a crankshaft sensor synchro failure. The car will turn but won't start. I replaced the fuel pump recently and tried to inject it some starting fluid to get it started. Nothing. I'm not having sparks. I just figured that's why I think it's the cam position sensor. My questions are, do I need to pull and replace the whole unit? That's this strange looking one with the little window in the top of it. Have you seen one of those? Odd looking thing. Uh, Basically, you got to pay. You got to get this whole thing. And it's really expensive if you have to have it. You can't just replace the sensor in it. All right, local auto parts dealer has convicting fuse. If I can, can I replace this the sensor? Do I need a sport special tool? Would you know the size of the two bolts that hold the sensor in place? Uh, they're very hard to reach. Thanks a lot. Cheers. What would you tell me about that? This is a no start, and he wants to go here. Does that sound feasible? I get no bar. Yeah. I say you can unplug the cam sensor and it will still start. The cam sensor ain't going to keep it from starting. Not on a Ford. That's crank. No, cam is what this is. CKP, not CKP, CPM. 
or a CMP. All right. The cam sensor won't keep it from starting. The crank sensor will. <coughs> Do you have 12 volts available at the coil pack on the red wire at key on? If not, let me know. Make sure the crank position wire it isn't chafing against ground anywhere. The crank sensor is most likely cause of it. You put a crank sensor on it and took care of it. He would have replaced the camshaft sensor first. I think the last time I priced one of those was like five hundred dollars. Ooh, Jesus! And a uh, much bigger hassle. So big. Thank you. All right. Here's a ninety model Chevrolet pickup truck. These are always fun. Hard to start. After it starts, it'll run for a short time, then die. Won't start back for a couple hours. Had distributor, fuel pump, computer plugs, wires put on it. Didn't solve the problem. Any help? Greatly appreciated. What do you see? What do you think? TBI. Throttle body injection. Got the two injectors. Huh? Kind of bad a bad injector. Let's see what I told you. We need to know what's missing when it doesn't start. Does it have spark? Does it have fuel or fuel pressure? Does the fuel injection work? If it's loading up too much in the throttle body, you're pretty sure it's in the fuel because when it dies, it won't start back. There is fuel standing on top of the butterflies. Both of them. Will one fuel injector make both butterflies come up with gas? So, we think the fuel evaporates within two hours and the reason then it starts back. Thank you, Wayne. Injectors on those engines do crazy things, but not both at once. It's not likely to be an injector. Find a way to check the fuel pressure. It'll be 12 PSI. If it's a lot higher than that, the return may be blocked. Probably not what it is. Make sure the intake air and engine coolant sensors are giving identical readings. Check their input circuits at the ECM, not the sensor, when the engine is cold. They should. If one of them is reading different than the other one, the sensor with the highest voltage would be the problem. So if you've got intake and air temperature and engine coolant temperature sensor that don't agree, if one of them is reading 40 below, it can make that thing, you know, run, try to run so, you know, crank so rich it wouldn't fire up. All right, I checked the different things you suggested with what tools I had. Put in a new temperature sensor right there by the thermostat housing. Started running okay, not leaving me stall somewhere for over a week. Maybe the problem solved. That's the sensor that's got the black and the yellow wire on it. Anyway, that's what took care of that. I always suspect that if one's put too much fuel in there, particularly on one of the older 2001 Toyota Solara. Check engine light had been on for years before I decided to remedy. Had it checked a while back with all the code that came up for something. Suggested we needed to replace my cat converter. Last year I went to Toyota thinking they'd give me proper service and exact diagnosis. They sucked, but that's a whole different story. They told me I needed a new cat and it would cost me over $2,500 to fix it. So, not having much on me, I went to a mechanic, was recommended by a friend who fixed it way cheaper. The check engine light was off, but the next day it popped back on. Went to Amco to get a free check engine light check, get another opinion. They said the same thing, I needed a new cat, but they were confused about the reading since they could see the catalytic converter I had was brand new. They said they'd need to do more investigating to see what the problem is. I spent over a thousand dollars trying to get this light off and it's still staring at me every day. I need to know what to do and what to ask for. A friend of mine also unhappy with Toyota told me she had a similar problem but she didn't use authentic Toyota parts. Her car wouldn't recognize any repairs, so she had to go to Toyota to get the engine turned off, blah, blah, blah. All right, tell me something. What do you got to do? They can get a torch and cut that cat up. Yeah, but lots of it. That's not going to get rid of the check engine line, huh? Yeah, be a bad O2 yeah. sensor. A bad O2 sensor? Yeah, well, the, the bad <coughs> part about this is, was I never really got a good follow-up from her, but I believe I know where her problem was. Uh, and I'm usually uncomfortable situation like this because if I mention any parts at all, whoever I'm talking to goes and buys the most expensive part and puts it on there, right? Sometimes the problem is simple and requires no parts. Uh, there's a right way to attack this problem, right? First thing you did wrong was not taking it back to the one that fixed it to begin with. That'll make you fix it right. The guy that fixed it way cheaper should have been held his feet held to the fire and straightened the darn thing out. Instead of going to this shop and I don't like what they did and I paid them a thousand dollars, I'm going to this guy. He's paying, I'm paying him a bunch of money and going to another shop because I'm not satisfied with either one of these guys and I'm paying them a bunch more money because everybody else is starting fresh, right? Always go back to the shop that did the repair first and go back to them right away. Don't wait. That being said, we're going to address the problem. And this stuff right here, there ain't no way they can do it. I mean, this, this person here could not do this. 
always replace any catalytic converter. When you've got a PO 420 code, uh, you know, or one of those codes that, that say the catalyst is bad, always replace the catalytic converter that's right in front of the rear oxygen sensor. Replacing just parts of the system will be sufficient to secure a PO 420. Replace the catalytic converter with the highest quality parts available. Now, here's the problem. Watch this. You see that catalytic converter up there? Watch what I'm talking about now. Don't be having private conversations whispering amongst yourself. See that catalytic converter up there? That's the one they replaced. Ordinarily, that's the one you would replace for a PO 420 code when the catalyst, when the light off caps right up there. This car is not like that, and that I think is what kicked their fannies. All right. Now that air fuel ratio sensor goes right here. Right. Watch this. Look at that. There's a catalytic converter right in front of that oxygen sensor they probably didn't even change. They changed the front one and charged a bunch of money for that. This is the one that should have been changed. Now let me go back. There's a caveat here. Most of the time, the one up in the front is the one that needs to be changed. But if you look down there and you see an oxygen sensor above and below the one that you're looking at when you just look right down there as soon as you open the hood, that's the catalyst you'll need to change for a PO420. And I've seen the one part of the back change when there was no oxygen sensor behind it. So there's no way it can monitor this one back here if there's no oxygen sensor behind it. <coughs> no follow-up. But, you know, most folks want a silver bullet. I didn't have one for this guy. All right, here's one right here. When I try to crank it, it clicks. The battery's good. Everything in the car works. I was told by the previous owner the backup lights didn't work. They replaced the starter. Still clicks here under the dash and fuse box. I'm thinking maybe the neutral safety switch. It acts as the back. Up light also, I tried moving the shift lever and rotating the steering wheel, still nothing. Is there any sights you can give me? It just, it started and engaged, but it won't turn. No, it just goes click, click, click. Starter relay is I mean, is all that starter relay? So the starter doesn't work. Think about what he just told you. The backup lights don't work, and he's thinking neutral safety switch. Hasn't done anything about it yet, that's what he's thinking. All right, you may be on to something with that backup light, the old neutral safety switch may be bad. See if the big wire leading from the battery to the starter has a strong 12 volts. See if the solenoid wire, the little one, gets 12 volts when you turn the key to start. If not, the neutral safety switch may be at fault. Make sure it's in park, feed 12 volts into that small terminal. If there's not any there, the starter should spin. But if it doesn't, make sure you check the ground connection from the battery to the engine, big negative wire, so on and so forth. I was telling him to pull the starter off and bench test it and all that. Thank you very much for your insight. The neutral safety switch was bad. The car was like him. He had already diagnosed this problem well enough <coughs> where he could fix it. And so he put a neutral safety switch on it and adjusted it out. Everything was fine. All right. What do you think about that series? Come on, guys. I need some feedback. Why don't we just have crickets in here? Crickets, crickets, crickets. This is the kind of stuff that you're going to hear people talking about. Whenever anybody that ever even puts in a little bit of time as a service advisor, you need to be knowing. You don't need to necessarily troubleshoot anybody's car if you're being a service advisor or a parts person, uh, but you need to be able to talk intelligently with them about what the problem is so you can give it good information to the person that is going to be working on it. And each one of these people was just customers that wanted their car looked at. You know, they, uh, they're sort of you know, spooked about going somewhere. Some of them will try to get as much information as they can before they go somewhere so they can tell if the person they're talking to is only helping them. You know what I mean? All right. Anybody got anything else to say? Okay, now we got another 30 minutes because nobody had anything to say. <laughs> I'm kidding.